reach out to the heavens don't be afraid the one who made the clouds make you brave reach out for the dream it gives you reach out and touch the sun you never made no dream without the way to get it done and we can fly on the wings of an eagle You know it cuts me to the bone Well I reach out to the father He makes me strong my tenure here in San Quentin, I've seen a lot of changes. I've seen some for the better and some for the worse. Really, it was convict labor, uh, slave labor, out of this rock quarry out here is where they got the rock and stuff to build this prison. I think the biggest problem in prison, in San Quentin especially, and in California prisons, is you have an intelligent type convict, and they're more aware, and they're more revolutionary-lized. And uh, I think the convicts, uh, like anybody else, they let a few run the majority. This is like a little world. It's like a little city. You've got your guys that will be the, the seller of the dope. You've got your guys that want to be tough guys. You've got your gang leaders. You've got your gangs. You've got uh, every element that you have on the streets. Here in this city, because you're so tight and you have so few people, you're more aware of the violence that goes down. You're more aware of the tension. You're more aware of everything. I, like. One thing can happen in San Quentin and it can affect everybody. A prison is like uh, being in a pressure pot, you know, and you're just waiting for that pressure pot to explode. I've seen guys that, that went all their way for, for, for a guard or for another convict. Then I've seen guys will stab you in the back for a lousy pack of cigarettes. The only time that I really relax and at that ease is when that door is locked at night. I'm spiked in that cell by myself. Then it seems like I can take that false face off and lay down and say, well, I made it another day. I started back in 67 when I first got arrested. You know, I was, uh, I got arrested for first degree murder and kidnapping and rape. And uh, at that time in my life, I was just, I was out there on the streets and I was just lost, you know. I didn't have any direction or anything like that. I was all caught up in, I was raised in a family, you know, that was just, you know, it was nothing but violence. You know, my father was an alcoholic and so was my mother. All I ever knew all my life was just violence and drunkenness and stuff, and I was a very confused kid. One night, uh, you know, I was out in the country, and this kid he came by, and he thought I was somebody else because I had a car like somebody that he knew or something, and he started playing little games with me in his car, running over close to me and that kind of thing. And uh, I was drunk, you know, and loaded and the whole thing, and I got real angry about it, you know. And we started playing these little games in the car, and I had a, a gun in my car, 
shotgun in my car, so I stopped him in the road, and when he got out of the car, I, you know, I got out of the car and I shot and killed him. You know, I never saw him before, didn't know him, nothing. But that was my, you know, my way of responding to anything, any, any kind of a problem at all, was through a violent way. Well, I was arrested for it, and I was taken to court and charged with first-degree murder and kidnapping and all the other charges, and I was convicted and, and uh, sentenced to death for it. I've been in San Quentin for the past eight years. I've been in the Department of Corrections since 1966, and I've got life without possibility pro. I picked it up for a kidnap robbery out of Bakersfield, California, back in September 1966. At the present time, I'm serving two life sentences, one for kidnapping and robbery, the other one for first-degree murder. I also have convictions for robberies, for shooting policemen, for escape, possession of weapons. I'm in here on a murder beef for murdering my wife, and I got a fire to life out of it, so I have to do six years. I spent approximately uh, almost 16 years, it'll be 16 years in October, uh, serving, more or less serving Satan and uh, committing crimes. I've been involved in uh, narcotics, uh, prostitution. Uh, murder. I had been in and out of prison most of my life. I'm 33 years old now. I started going to prison when I was around six years old. Robbing and stealing and burglarizing and things. I've been playing those games and trying to get my life together. You know, it's like I had a job, I was dealing, and my life just wasn't, you know, wasn't what I wanted it. You know, I thought that, that you know, a prosperous life was, you know, having money and having things and, you know, material wealth. There was no satisfaction in the void that I, that I was trying to fulfill. Uh, the car, if you had a new car, you know, was, uh, the clothes or the association with women or women or narcotics or gambling or, or whatever, there was nothing, there was nothing uh, to fulfill uh, what I was seeking inside. You know, the, the, the happiness and the joy and the peace wasn't in, in money or in materialistic things. I see myself something as, as being a victim of Madison Avenue in terms of, I thought happiness could be secured from material acquisition, the new cars, the nice clothes, and it took me a lot of time. I've got 14 years in now to basically come to the realization that what is happiness, or what I find to be happiness, cannot be secured from things around me. And they sent me here to San Quentin in 67. And, uh, I went straight up to death row when I got here. You know. And. Uh, when I arrived here, it was, you know, right at that time, just a few weeks after Aaron Mitchell was executed. He was the last guy that was executed here at San Quentin. And uh, the tension up there at that time, man, it was just unbelievable. You know, I mean, guys were walking up and down the tiers, talking to themselves, you know, and just going berserk. You know, two-thirds of them had, had execution dates at that time. And it was just, uh, man, it was just, uh, you know, just like walking into hell itself. The gas chamber itself, as you're walking up to it, sort of surprises most people in terms that it's not a big place. It's actually quite small. It's almost like a diving bell with a couple chairs sitting inside. The 
small windows naturally are there for the witnesses to view the person to be executed and to assure also that they had the 12 witnesses are able to view the man at the time of his death. Upon entering the gas chamber itself, the smallness is what really, you really closed in on quick. You notice immediately the two chairs, the way the brackets are set up for the legs, for the arms. It's a brutal way to die. Uh, most people claim, well, it knocks a man out, but anytime you're taking 12 to 18 minutes to kill a man, that's an awful long time. The last execution took place here in San Quentin was in April 1967. I was here on the yard at the time. It was an unusual experience since they had not been in any executions, I think, to about six years previous to that. But it wasn't just another day at San Quentin. It was a, you know, it was a, a legal execution is what it was. After four and a half years, I, one night I was laying up in the row and I just, man, I just couldn't take it anymore. You know, waking up each morning with the thought of being executed and going to sleep each night with the thought of being executed, that's all you ever thought about was death, constantly. And I just couldn't take it anymore, you know, it was just too much, so. That was the first time that I ever really called out to Christ for help. One of those times, man, I just couldn't take it anymore. So I got down on my knees and I prayed, you know. I said, I don't really believe in you, you know. I, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, but you're the only hope I've got. You know, and I prayed that he would let me off death row, you know, to help me get off death row. And then just a few months later, I went and I got another trial, went back to another trial and, and was given a life sentence. Well, you know, I knew, you know, that, that, that the Lord had answered my prayer, but I was the kind of person that had just hardened himself up so much inside all of his life that I just couldn't open up. You know, I knew that he was calling me, you know, that he, that he was there, you know, just for the asking. I was in the Monesto County Jail, and I just broke down in that cell. First, I began to curse the Lord, you know, and to really cap on him about the life that I was living. I was kind of blaming God for the life that I was living. I wasn't really looking at it like it was, you know, really was it. I was the cause of my life, you know. I was apart from God. I wasn't, use, I wasn't letting God use me. I wasn't letting God bless me. I hadn't put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd heard about putting my trust in him, but I hadn't exercised trust in Christ. But I can remember as just like yesterday when I received Jesus Christ into my life and I quit playing games with him. And I asked him for a new life, you know, for a new attitudes, for a new heart, a new mind. <laughs> Three years ago, this was the most violent year that this prison has ever experienced. There were 87 men stabbed inside of San Quentin and 12 of those were fatal deaths. More than 100 days, our men were locked in their cells. That's like being locked in your restroom. But the men, when they began to come out, the fellows who came to the chapel began to show a concern that there might be revival at San Quentin. And so they prayed that there would be revival, first of all, with the inmates, but also among the staff. That's really beautiful just to be able to be an instrument of the Lord, you know, here in San Quentin and see the fruits that God is bringing about through the ministry. We're coming out of the West Block unit now. This is the honor block, and this is where we live. The Lord is doing a good work over here. He's also uh, working, there's the hottest spot of the ministry right now is in the North Block unit, which is the Max B unit, and there's a lot of men coming to Christ there. And we just share Christ crucified. We share the new birth. Men aren't so interested in a religious doctrine. They're really interested in a change of direction through the power of Christ within. We need a change of life. We're not really in tune with God. And then we follow up on the men. The Lord's been opening doors here in San Quentin, and we just praise God that he moves men to open doors. So when Ray came down, you know, and, and he shared what Christ was doing in his life, and he gave me a Bible and he gave me some books to read, some testimonies. And I read them, you know, and I got to really think. And, and it was really kind of funny the day I received the Lord. Ray was walking down the tier, you know, and I was laying back reading. And, and I see him go by, and I screamed at him. You know, I yelled at him. I said, hey, Ray. And he came back. You know, it wasn't a, he asked me if I thought I could get my life together. He asked me, if, you know, if I, if I wanted a new life, if I, you know, wanted that new direction that Christ had to offer, you know, what he had given Ray. And I told him, yeah, you know, and he says, well, you know, we have to, we have to ask Christ in our lives. And so that day I got down and asked Christ in my life with Ray. And from that day on, as Ray come by and encouraged me to read and studied, and it seemed like every time I read something, I seen John and I seen my old life and you know I always found tears rolling down my face and, and I found myself confessing you know that 
the old life that I led and how bunk it was. And God has drawn me into the cell ministry. He's given me a, a compassion in my heart to share Christ with others. And I just praise God that as, you know, as he's seen my need that day, you know, that he reached down and he touched me. I was discontent, I was angry, I was full of hate, I was suspicious of people. I got involved in revolutionary activity. I was a black nationalist leader. I got involved in this uh, because I, I was gang oriented, I guess, and I needed the gang to, to give me a sense of security and things. And I really thought I'd, I became Marxist oriented and I really thought that I had found the uh, answer to the American problem and to the problems of the world. But really, I'd mistaken myself. And I, I knew that I was breaking the law and things like that, but I didn't have a conscience about it. I really didn't feel bad about it. You know, I, I, I was raised up to always think that it was kind of like survival of the fittest, like we were kind of living in a, uh, a jungle or, or a savage society or something. But since I, I received Christ into my life, he, he didn't change all that, and I, I, I view things differently now. And I'm just thankful I have him, you know. When I first came in, I didn't know nothing about Christ, and what even thinking nothing about Christ. All I was thinking about is getting out, getting revenge of myself for myself. My whole life has changed. I can tell the whole thing has changed. I see a different perspective on, on life itself now. I don't have that anger when I first came into prison. I used to be a numbers runner on streets like this in Chicago, where I'd pick up the numbers of small restaurants and pawn shops. And as we go by this pawn shop here, we used to hawk our merchandise in these type of pawn shops. You look and you see all the jewelry in a window today of down and outers that had to hawk their belongings to make it by on the streets. You got the element that still walks the streets today with no place to go or to stay. You have the theaters yet, they go up and down, and the X-rated theaters along the way, more money to loan on your windows. We made our money back then shaking these places down, making them pay for protection. If they didn't, we would burn them, break their glass, rob them. And in my 23 years of coming up in the underworld, that was doing things like this, to start me into power to bring me along through life. I've been a dope fiend all my life. I don't even have any veins, man. You know, I got manholes and pits. Uh, even in the joint, whenever there was drugs, you know, I had a piece of it, you know? Where, wherever wherever the, the drugs were, I was. You know, I was probably uh, that, that quick from going totally insane. I mean, I, it was all just coming out of me, garbage, poison. The language that came out of me, would peel the paint off this building. You know, it was just nothing but garbage. I didn't care if I lived or I didn't care what happened to me. And so I was a threat to everybody that encountered me. I had went completely insane. And one of the things that he told me in my mind was throw away your dope. Well, for me to throw away my dope was like for you to go burn down a $60,000 house that you just paid for and your insurance alas. We're standing in front of Parker Center, the administrative headquarters of the 10,000-man Los Angeles Police Department. I'm Deputy Chief Bob Vernon, commanding officer of Operation Central Bureau. Here in Los Angeles, we have over 7,300 sworn police officers and 3,000 3, civilian employees. And we police a city of over 3 million. When you've got 3 million people, you've got problems. As a Special Assistant Attorney General here in the state of California, uh, across our desk come every single criminal appeal in this state. And we're responsible then for, uh, in essence, every individual who's in any of our prisons. There's a process which society has in front of us that is, that can be a God-honored process and a God-anointed process, but a judge, a policeman, a district attorney, as I was, needs to have some divine assistance to know what the right solution is for the person that's in front of them. 
73 L73, a uh, bank alarm at 51 East 14th, the Fokker Citizens Bank, incident number 965. 904, I'll be responding, code 3. 3 L73, 904. Seventy-three and all of the units. Uh, Nine and three eight on the uh, bank alarm. False alarm. Seventy-three check. I came with Oakland in 1965. My primary responsibility is as a patrol sergeant. I've got 13 young policemen that I work with, and their safety, and their well-being, and their job performance, and even their training is my primary responsibility. I came in to go to work one morning. I was working the day watch, working primarily West Oakland. And I came in to go to work, and I saw grown men sitting around on the lockers, weeping openly. I walked up to one of the guys that I knew real well, Al Boccaccio, and I said, hey, Al, man, what's the matter? What's wrong? He said, John Fry was killed this morning. And I just couldn't believe it. Uh, John Fry was the man that I was to relieve at 7.30 that morning. He was the partner on my beat that I was to uh, go out and, and exchange cars with and equipment. I had to go out and stand by that police car. I'll never forget that scene as, as I drove out there in another car and I picked up some of John's equipment and brought it back in. I had to stand by a puddle of blood there and I thought, man, just a couple of hours ago this was John Fry standing here and now he's gone. I went to that officer's funeral and I'd been running games, as I said, on everybody else, facades and fronts. But you know, there was one thing about it. I hadn't fooled God in the least. Not one iota was he fooled. And I went and I looked at that body laying there in that blue uniform, and God's spirit dealt with me. And I heard that still, small voice say, just as easily, that could have been you. I said, God, I'm a nothing, and I'm a nobody. But whatever I've got, it's yours. And at that moment, I felt a peace like I'd never felt before, like a Mack truck had just rolled off of me. Now, I'd be lying to you if I sat here and told you that a change began overnight, because I'd been a professing Christian, but my life sure hadn't been professing Christ. But gradually and slowly, in the love and the nurture of God, as he always does with his babies, I started to grow a little bit, and I started to realize that God had a purpose for me being in law enforcement. I can meet a policeman. I can say, hello, I love you. I can even love cops, man. And I used to hate cops. When you're working out on the street, you become just as the people that you're working with. I hate to use the word animal, but that's just exactly how you become. You work with people that hate you, and you wind up hating people. But just recently, I've found a way that I can deal with people. I've found a way of loving people that I've never found before, and that's through our Lord Jesus Christ. A policeman, in good faith, tries to find solutions for himself and for society, but if he only has him, his own experience to go on, then he's very limited. Whereas if he has had the experience that I have had, that is, that God can provide answers, then when he meets with a person who is in the process of committing a crime, he can deal with them a whole lot differently. I've learned how to deal with people. I find myself praying now before I go on a call, not to just simply arrest them or to work somebody over, but praying that I can help them out. And I've found that in the last six months, I've only had to physically take care of two people. Whereas before, in a six month period, it wouldn't be an abnormal for me to have to take care of 15 or 20 physically. I had a mind for violence. I had a very hair type trigger temper, and I'd lose this temper very fast. And if anybody disagreed with me, or if anybody should ever doubt what I had to say, I would fly off in a minute. I had to destroy the person somehow, physically. <laughs> common thread that seems to run through the lives of every person uh, with whom I've been in contact over the last many years is the human need factor. 
I found that uh, in almost every case, the human need is the same. And this is, uh, you know, cared for in many ways. There are literally thousands of people and organizations who are today attempting to rehabilitate man. Rehabilitation, uh, that's, a, that's a, uh, an interesting term. Uh, I think the prisons and the prison system and uh, uh, realize that rehabilitation uh, is, is just a farce. Last year in our city, 42% of those that we arrested for armed robbery were on parole for armed robbery when we arrested them in 1976. We think that's significant. That's just one of the indicators of what you've heard, I'm sure, as the revolving door policy. Going into prison, coming back out again, going in, coming back out. I guess, even though I'm a police administrator, I'm first to admit the prison system we have today really doesn't solve the problem. Those we have put in the penitentiary or have come in contact with in law enforcement and have gone through the rehabilitation programs many times are back out on the street and they're doing, uh, in many cases, the same thing that they were doing before. And uh, I am convinced that the only answer for a man's problems and the thing that straightens his life up and makes him go straight is a personal knowledge and faith in Jesus Christ and what he can do for him. I think the only way that a men are actually going to find to stay out of prison is they're going to have to accept the Lord as their Savior and change their life. Let him come into their life. He's going to have to change it. You can't change it by yourself. I found that it's impossible to change behavior unless you change the man committing that behavior. Unless you change a man from the inside out, you're going to have the same man coming back to the streets to commit the same crimes again and again. In my life, I found that that change could only be met through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Real rehabilitation comes through the knowledge and the acceptance of Jesus Christ as Savior. Because when a man's life is changed, and when his attitude is changed, and his heart is changed, and he has a new brain and a new heart, uh, he's going to be a different person. That's what I needed. <laughs> I needed a new brain, you know, and new attitudes. All those years caught up with me, man. Bam, bam, bam. It finally hit me. I was totally crazy. Well, God changed all that. He actually healed my brain. I was a person that, you know, was brought up to believe in God and things, you know, but uh, like my family believed in God, but believing and, and, you know, making commitment of some kind is a totally different thing. We don't always understand the way that God works, but as he has worked in my life for a year and about a week, you know, I can look back on that year and, and see the old John and see the new John that, that's, that Christ has made. And uh, what a life. To, to be a Christian, it's, it's not easy. You know, you, once, once you turn your life over and say, all right, I'm, I'm making a commitment to attempt to follow Christ's teachings is what it's all about, there's no one that can do it. You're going to all fall short. And uh, the thing is, is that you can overcome your old ways. You're not going to, those things won't fit in. You're not going to want to get loaded. You're not going to want to do this and do that because it's uncomfortable. It just doesn't fit to, it doesn't fit to your nature anymore. It was like, you know, dirt clocks got busted loose out of a clogged up pipe. It was like something was removed from me. I've been carrying it, uh, you know, for all my life, and you got used to carrying it. You didn't even know you were carrying it, right? But all of a sudden, it was gone. And, and, and it was a beautiful feeling. And I knew that there was a God. I knew that God was real. And I knew that he touched me, you know? And like, 
there's a lot of beautiful things that can happen. Things that you never thought would happen in your life, happen in your life. Like today, you know, like I, I've got a beautiful, exciting life. I'm high on the natch. And I think I used to stuck all that, that chemical into my veins, you know, to feel good. And, and all the things that I was missing. Because, you know, there's just so many beautiful things. I'm into things out here that, you know, I just like, and I used to sit there, you know, in, 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 in the joint, thinking I'll never get out, never. Jesus knows how many hairs I got in my head. He knows how many marks I got on my body. And he's not up there saying, Jerry, are you having a good time? Well, cool it. He wants me to have a good time. He wants to bless me. And he's done that. You know, I got wall to wall happiness, man. I'm burnt out, man. I am burnt out on listening to these toilets flushing. Really. I'm burnt out on hurting people. I'm burnt out on spending my life, man, behind a cage like an animal. Man, I want out of this body. And I gave it up to Jesus Christ. And man, I'm telling you, it's been sweet. It gets sweeter every day, praise his holy name. And Jesus is for every brother here. Man, he loves each and every one of you. He wants to set you free. If the Son therefore sets you free, what? Amen. Free indeed. In the Word of God, man, the Word of God right here is life. I used to think it was a big flim flam trip written by a bunch of men trying to keep me down. I used to think it had colors in it. That ain't got no colors in it. That's spirit, man, that's spirit. That's spirit. That's the spirit of Jesus. If you want to meet Jesus, open that book up and check him out. Come and see him. Check him out. Now is the acceptable time, right now. Now is the day of salvation. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, and he will abundantly pardon. You want a pardon? You want a pardon? Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask Jesus Christ, don't ask him to get out. Don't ask him to bring your old lady back. Ask him for a new brain. Ask him for a new life. I look back at my life now and I wonder what I would have done if there wasn't a Jesus in my life today. What I would have done without him. It would have been, I wouldn't have been reborn, and I wouldn't have been saved. I wouldn't have been given another chance in life. I couldn't depend on my government, my state, my city government to give me another chance. The only way was Christ in my whole life. Until then, I did not really know the Lord. And now I know what a beautiful person he really is. The ego trip of, of being part of, say, a motorcycle club, it's something that, that fills you with something that isn't real. The Lord can fill you with something that's real. The love, the, the, the joy, the grace of God. And I'll guarantee you, if you pray this short, simple prayer with your heart in it, God will make you a new creature. And if he doesn't, you come check with me and I'll throw this in the trash can and go back to fixing hair on, all right? Let's say a prayer together, all right? Lord Jesus, I come to you a sinner. I know there is no good thing in me. I come to you broken. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to come into my life, to make me a new creature for your glory. Give me a hunger for your word, Lord, and a thirst after righteousness. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. North wind is blowing. South wind is too. Storm is getting closer. Holds 
out his right hand And he lifts you and I And we can fly on the wings of an eagle So close to the sun Oh